Good morning, happy, beautiful Monday, and welcome to another episode of Coffee Talk Live. This is a show where my guest and I explore what it means to live a sustainable, healthy life as women, as mothers in the home and in the community. I'm your host, Connie Pastorius, founder of Pastorius Fitness, an online coaching community for moms who are ready to regain their health and reclaim their lives. I'm also the founder of the Strong as a Mother online community here, which is a Facebook group for moms that sets the standard for what online fitness and nutrition support should be. So no fad diets, no MLM, no BS. So do me a favor, drop a one in the comments or a good morning if you're watching live with us or a two if you're catching the replay. But either way, please don't be shy. I want to hear your voice in this conversation too. So please feel free to add your input, ask your questions, and we will get to them in our conversation. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the link in the description of this video so you can join a community of amazing moms just like you. So I want to get to the reason why we're here today. So today's guest, you've seen her before if you're in the Strong as a Mother group. She is my neighbor around the corner, but more awesomely, she is a holistic nutritionist that has um, built her career first as a doula. So a really awesome, empathetic um, approach to nutrition, specifically for moms. I am so excited to have this chat with her today. So please join me in welcoming Coach Erica Schultz. Good morning, Erica. Good morning, how are you? I'm good. Can you tell I've had at least some coffee? Yeah, I'm working on my cup too. <laughs> I'm not you, quite where you are yet. Well, listen, I'm, I'm, I've am I'm scared my husband because I said, listen, I think we need to not cut out but decrease our overall coffee intake, if not just for a financial reason, because we go through it so fast. So How he, much coffee do you drink per day? So if you want to admit it. <laughs> As a as a family, um, Chris and I brew two pots of coffee that use two ounces of beans per pot. And the way we use is pour over. So that's eight ounces of water per two ounces, uh, well, per half ounce. So a little bit of math okay. for us this morning. That is eight times four. That's 32, 32. ounces of coffee. And we were doing it twice a day. It's a lot. Which is, it's a lot. <laughs> So sometimes we waste a little, which I never like doing, but now that it's like cold brew and iced coffee season and iced tea season, where I, I want to cut down on at least the second half of the day with the coffee. I Plus, do a 10 ounce cup and that's it. <laughs> that's, that's my, I cut myself off after that because it, it affects my sleep and just like later in the day unless I'm having a really crazy day and like need that second cup or if I'm supporting a birth client and like working through the night, then, you know, I'll change, but 10 ounces, that's it. Well, you know, you, you, you build a tolerance to the caffeine and it's not fun when you get up to these like higher levels of coffee. Now you're just, especially if you don't drink it black, cause then you're just adding extra calories or sugar, but like, I don't like needing it. Surprisingly. You have to wean yourself off so that you don't get that migraine or get jittery or overly jittery, I guess. So yeah. maybe you'll go down to a pot and a half or like, you know, and kind of wean down more gradually. Yeah. I have to like, <laughs> I turned him into this coffee person. Uh, he used to just be fine with like the instant cappuccino powder. And I slowly, this is like years ago. I slowly just started pouring a little bit of my coffee into his cup when he wasn't looking. And then eventually it just completely replaced that sugary stuff. <laughs> and then I've created a monster. I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I, my husband I, was the same for me though. I mean, he didn't pour coffee in my cup, but he definitely introduced me to better tasting coffee. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. And then now it's just like something to enjoy, not just something to like wake you up. 
Oh, exactly. This isn't this is coffee talk. It's not just coffee talk. So let's get to the the uh, conversation today. So yeah, this is this is something that like it, it comes up all the time, regardless of uh, whether they're a coaching client, whether it's a friend I'm having a conversation with, or whether I'm just walking around the grocery store. We see different labels marked on packages of food, and the point of it is, the point of those labels is to get you to buy it thinking it's good for you or to think that it's like in line with what you want to do or what, what you want to eat or whatever. But the thing is, consumers don't always know that there aren't really rules. There are exactly. very, very loose rules to what uh, what companies can say about their foods. And I, you know, one of my goals is obviously, and your goals as well, is to help women feel empowered with the knowledge to live sustainable, healthy lives. And I think that should start with understanding what the nutrition label means, what we should actually care about on that label, because we don't really have to look at everything. And also, if there's um, kind of like flags or, or things we should notice on packaging that are not what they say they are. So absolutely. Let's and do it. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing. We're, we're going into the grocery store or we're going into, you know, any type of market or um, in New York, we have a lot of like open air markets, um, whether they're, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, farmer's markets or things like that. But there's still, you know, sometimes those prepackaged foods. Um, and you're absolutely right. They are marketed to grab our attention and for us to want to buy them. And a lot of the labels that they're using, like natural or whole grain, are extremely misleading because there aren't regulations behind, you know, what your product has to have or not have to be able to use those labels. So manufacturers, companies are putting those labels on their foods to make them more attractive, to make more people buy them. And they're not very healthy. And, you know, they're easy. You know, a lot of these things like granola bars or um, just, you know, bags of easy snacks, uh, they're, they're easy. They are great for on the go. We all utilize those at some point in our lives. I mean, I keep snacks in my, in my purse or like whatever tote bag I'm using because I get overly hungry. And when that happens, I get hangry. So, you know, easy snacks are those granola bars, are, you know, applesauce pouches, which of course have, you know, a little bit of something to keep them fresh. But, you know, it's, it's okay to use these things, but as it's not okay for these to be all the only things that we use. So, you know, it's all about modification and balance. But there are definitely things to look for when you're shopping for different things or just going through your pantry and seeing what you have, kind of check out what the label says on your granola bars or on your bag of chips or whatever it might be to see, okay, this probably isn't the best choice. Next time when I go to the store to buy this, I wanna look for something similar that's going to provide my body with more nutrition and help to fuel it in a better way. Yeah. I think the biggest things that we see are those like buzzwords, like multi-grain, all natural, um, locally grown. When it comes to eggs, things like cage-free or pasture-raised are really misleading. Um, cracked wheat, 100% wheat, you know, those, those are really, you know, they're, they're words that make us think that these are good carbohydrates, good sources of grains but they're actually not. They're those refined grains, which don't have a lot of nutritional value for us. So we really do need to turn the package over and look at the ratio of different things in the ingredients. We need to look at the ingredient list itself. If you can't pronounce anything in it, don't buy it. You know, it's, these manufacturers kind of, they hide things in the, in the label. And you know, we want to make sure that we are choosing food that's real versus all of this processed crap that isn't good for us. Yeah. And there's been like decades of, you know, fat-free being the, the main buzzword, but that ends up 
piling in sugar because you're like, I don't care. It's fat free. So it's good for me, but it's loaded with carbohydrates, sugar. And then that, I think that did have a correlation to the rise in obesity, but that'll be another conversation uh, for another day and diabetes. But now the new buzzwords are keto, paleo friendly, gluten free, but these don't mean anything. Uh, especially if you're cherry picking what you're like, what diet you're kind of leaning towards. And you say like, oh, there's a breakfast syrup that's whole 30 approved, but I'm pouring it on my buttermilk pancakes. Or if I'm getting a keto, uh, I'm, I'm on breakfast foods. I mean like keto French toast, but I'm still pouring maple syrup on it. And, yeah. and thinking like just letting you're that cereal, but you're having, you know, three times the serving size. Yeah. 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 So because it's what we, I think what we want to do is have just trust that we're making a healthy decision either for us or for our kids, but let's get into like what it actually means to kind of like take control and ownership of knowing like what foods we're buying. So let's turn over the late, let's turn the package over and talk uh, Erica about what's actually important to pay attention to on the nutrition label. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a document that I'd love to share. Um, Gonna make you the host. Perfect. There you go. And let's see. So this is where is my there we go. So this is just really breaking down what you see on that nutrition label. So um, serving size, which is this red bubble here on both sides, we want to take a look at. And these are like the big things to, to look at. Serving size calories, fat, um, carbohydrates, cholesterol and sodium, daily value, and of course, like the ingredient list. But out of all of these bubbles, the biggest ones are serving size, fat, calories, and carbohydrates, in my opinion, at least. So when it comes to serving size, you most likely are going to think that this serving size is so small. And a lot of people will eat, you know, double the serving size or triple the serving size. And that's where things really go haywire because you're choosing a food that maybe is a really good choice nutritionally, but if you're eating a ton of it and there is some, you know, added sugar, maybe there is some added fat, then by doubling or tripling that, you're not really doing your body any good. Calories is another thing to think about. Remember, our calories are our energy, the energy that our body is getting from our food. So, you know, again, this is calories based on the serving size. All of these uh, numbers, all of these portions are based on that serving size, which I think a lot of people know, but it's always good to just kind of have a reminder that it's based on that two thirds of a cup for this label. Um, you know, calories are really important when we're working toward weight loss. And we kind of understand that we need to be burning more calories than we're eating. So, you know, if we're not paying attention to that, then we could easily eat way more calories than we're burning. And we're not meeting our weight loss goals. We're either gaining or we're maintaining our weight. And that's really not helpful. Um, as a general rule, we want to not have more than about 25 to 35% 30 of our calories from our fat. So it breaks it down here, calories from fat. On this label, it's, it's 40. So this probably isn't the best choice uh, just because it's, it's providing us a lot more calories from fat than, I mean, I guess not a lot, 35 to 40 is not that many, but if you're if you're constantly eating foods that are giving you a few more calories from fat than ideal, that's going to add up. So in looking at the fat, we know that there are saturated fats, there are trans fats, and these are the bad fats. And I believe back several years ago, trans fats were you know, banned by the FDA, but they just hide them in other places a lot of times. They recategorize, relabel. So it's good to just pay attention to what's in the food as well. And let's talk for a second <clears throat> about trans fat. So I believe if a product has a half a gram of trans yes. fat, like up to a half a gram, it can still be labeled as zero. 
So it can still exist, but we don't like trans fats because during the hydrogenation process, thinking of back to your organic chemistry class, um, hydrogenation means forcing more hydrogen molecules into the fat chain, which makes it more stable. And in doing so, it creates a fat chain that our bodies don't know how to break down. We can't break down trans fats. So what does it do? It gets stored as a fat that our bodies just can't really do anything with. So that's why we're, we're really not fans of trans fats. And then similarly with saturated fat, uh, we don't like that as much because it's saturated means every hydrogen space on this chain is full. So it's harder for our bodies to break down. Now, unsaturated fats mean there's a, that means there's a little hole in that chain. So our body can break that down easier and utilize it in ways that are healthy for supporting brain health and uh, you know, our circulatory system, our skin, you know, a lot of different uh, valuable things to having uh, the quote unquote healthy fats. But that's the, the short <laughs> lesson on why uh, fats aren't created equal and we really want to avoid trans fats. Exactly. And those saturated and trans fats are also increasing our risk for disease. So we want to limit that as much as possible. And we want our fats to be coming from our healthy fats. Um, let's talk about the daily value a little bit. So the daily value, it's not listed here. Actually, it is right down here. I don't have it circled. But the daily value, which is all of these percentages over here, uh, that is based on a 2,000 calorie per day diet. Now, unless you are like weightlifting, unless you're a bodybuilder, you probably are not eating anywhere close to 2,000 calories a day. Uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of clients that we're working with are somewhere between maybe like 14 and 1600 calories a day, or maybe 1800. So we also have to remember that this label is not going to fit us to a T. This is a very generalization uh, for the, you know, calories per day. And it's not going to help you to reach your weight loss goals if you're following everything on this label. If you are having, you know, two thirds of a cup and it's eight grams of fat, well, you know, yes, that's true. It's eight grams of fat, but you have less calories to eat per day to reach your weight loss goals. So you're going to fill that a lot more quickly if you have a cup of this. And, you know, I, I don't feel like a lot of people realize that this is based on a 2000 calorie diet or really understand that it's not true for them because this is a very big generalization that came out a long time ago and uh you know we've learned a lot since then i don't know why it's not reevaluated but you know every body and every person's goals are so different that it's never going to fit everybody so you know i think 2000 is probably just an easier number to use and they've gone with it. But keep that in mind that this does not fit you to a T and that you might have to adjust these percentages or just be aware that, you know, this is based on a 2000 calorie diet. So if I'm only eating, you know, 1500 calories a day, then the fat is not going to be 12% of my daily value. It's going to be more because I'm eating less calories overall. Yeah. And I think, so as far as like the percent daily value, I, th I think the only thing that we really could get value from is looking at the vitamins and mineral content. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who is supplementing with say iron or taking a calcium pill, um, is paying attention to what those vitamins you're getting from this item. That way you're not risking over consuming it because with some uh, minerals and vitamins, they don't, like with vitamin B, you can pretty much drink a gallon of it and whatever you don't use, you're just gonna pee out. But with some other ones like iron, calcium, um, it can accumulate in your body if you have too much of it. So not to like scare you away, but just paying attention and saying like, oh, this is a very high uh, iron, content item, which I'm curious, what, do you know what this is? Like what, no, the, no I, it's, a, I, it, 
I have some kind of cereal. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I don't know exactly what this is. I probably should <laughs> modify and use something I know. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right when it comes to the vitamins. And it can be really hard to track because you know, you're eating so many different things per day. So if you're getting, and remember, this daily value is based on 2000 calories per day. So if this is saying for iron, you're getting 45%, and then you're eating something else that's giving you 35%, like it's so hard to predict exactly how much you're getting. Um, but it is definitely something to look at. But also, this is where, you know, having uh, your iron levels or having your different levels checked by your physician is really helpful because we don't always know. And even if you're taking an iron supplement, for example, I take an iron supplement and, you know, there are different types of iron in our body. There's iron that's circulating in our body. There's iron that's stored in our body. And one number can be within normal range and one number can be really low. So it's good to be aware, but also you know, there's no way to know for sure how much of uh, different vitamins you have unless you have a complete blood count and those things are checked. But definitely being aware so you're not eating too much of certain foods is really helpful. Oh, I love that you're advocating uh, maintenance appointments with your doctor. That's it's awesome. so important. You know, that's, and I don't think we talk about that enough and maybe we can at one at some point, but like we can't do it all ourselves. You know, I, I am not in a, a scope of practice where I can say, okay, go get your, you know, complete blood count done. Let's look at it. Let's change things. That's, a, you know, your, your health professional, that's your physician that needs to help to guide you in that way too. And we should all be working as a team. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm on the phone with your doctor, but it means that we kind of have the same goals to help you. Right. And I do think it's important. I've definitely like in some circumstances with clients who like, at least on the fitness side of things, they had particular conditions. And I was like, here's my contact information. Let the doctor know that I would be happy to like share any kind of program that I'm doing with them to make sure that like this is safe and this is in alignment with like what they want. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, but this is a good opportunity where the doctor can tell the patient, hey, I want you to improve your overall iron intake from, from foods. And then you can be like, hey, Erica, what are some examples of iron rich foods? And that's the role that nutritionists play. We don't diagnose, but we help, uh, we help you with whatever it is that you are working with by giving examples. Exactly. And unfortunately, a lot of physicians will just say, okay, here's a prescription for an iron supplement. And, you know, we have to advocate for ourselves and say, you know what, I don't have a problem taking it, or, you know, I'll take part of it, but I want to work on increasing what I'm getting from food. And iron can be more difficult to get what you need from food. And I'm not saying you shouldn't supplement. Like I said, I take an iron supplement myself. But, you know, I think it's important to think about the ways that we can change what our bodies need. And that's not just through supplementation. Right. Uh, I think food plays a really big role. And um, supplements are another unregulated industry for another conversation. <laughs> exactly. That'll be a good conversation at some point. But yeah. um, let's move on and let's talk about carbohydrates, because I think that's another really important aspect to talk about. Um, and we want to look for a couple of things when it comes to carbohydrates. We want to try to choose foods where sugars are not listed in the first five ingredients, because what are sugars? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. So they are not going to fuel our body in a very great way that's going to su sustain it for a while. They're going to kind of like, just like our coffee, it's going to give us that quick, you know, hit, and then we're going to kind of uh, drop down from it at some point. But uh, carbohydrates and sugar are definitely important for anyone managing diabetes because our sugar affects our insulin. Anyone who is pregnant and trying to, you know, limit the risk for gestational diabetes, things like that. Or, you know, when it comes to weight loss, there are a lot of different factors, especially with women, PCOS, that are or can be affected by our insulin and our body's ability to 
use the sugar and, and kind of use the insulin. So we want to make sure that we are choosing good carbohydrates and checking the ingredients. Um, we also want to look at fiber. So there are two different types of fiber. And I know, Connie, this was, um, this is something that is often really confusing uh, because, you know, both types of fiber are good for us. They do different things and we want to have both, but it's the balance of which types of fiber we're having. So, you know, fiber overall, it helps, it helps to aid our digestion. It helps to keep our bowels really regular. Uh, and there's soluble fiber and there's insoluble fiber. I'm actually gonna adjust my screen share really quickly and kind of show you a little bit more about fiber. Oh yes, I love and this. This helps to break it down some. So let's talk about soluble fiber first. These foods, these types of fiber are holding on to water. They form this gel in our GI tract and it slows down that transit time. So it's slowing down our digestion and it's giving us that full feeling for longer. So those are all, you know, beneficial things, right? We are keeping our belly full and uh, we're not getting really hungry. It's helping to stabilize our blood sugar um, and helping to lower our cholesterol, all good things, right? Um, this is really helpful for constipation, you know, increasing your soluble fiber and like I said, reducing cholesterol, um, and as you can see, good sources are chia, sweet potatoes, flax, broccoli, oats, you know, any type of fruits and vegetables, legumes, barley, rye. These are all really great things to incorporate into our diet. There's a caveat though. Yep. Go ahead. You have to drink water. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what happens if you don't drink water, Erica? this is all going to sit and it's not going to go anywhere and you're going to have a bad time. Yes, yeah. It's going to be real uncomfortable. So yes, <laughs> do not forget to drink your water. Um, I, you know, we really can't remind people enough to drink water, <laughs> but for sure, drink your water. Um, let's talk about the insoluble fiber. So this is not holding on to the water. It's basically adding bulk to your diet and it helps to promote those healthy, regular bowel movements. So yes, it's helpful, but again, we wanna come back to the balance of soluble and insoluble fiber. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, you know, to create those healthy bowel movements, insoluble fiber kind of acts as a laxative. So if you haven't used the bathroom in a few days, if you're having some digestive upset, have some more insoluble fiber to kind of get things going and then go get back to your kind of normal balance of soluble versus insoluble fiber. The insoluble fiber also helps to maintain the muscle tone of the GI tract. And, you know, we need healthy muscle tone of the GI tract because that's essentially what is keeping everything moving and keeping things healthy. Um, so, Again, it all comes down to that balance. Insoluble fiber also helps to reduce cholesterol. Uh, and we find insoluble fiber in these, you know, whole grain type of foods. So whole wheat, brown rice, barley, nuts, seeds, again, some fruits and vegetables. So both are good, but we want to try to have more insoluble fiber than soluble fiber, if I'm not messing this up. No, that um, sounds so good. We, yep. So we want to have, really, it's a three to one ratio. We want three kind of, uh, not portions, but like we want three times more the amount of insoluble fiber in our diet than soluble fiber. So when you think about it, about a quarter of your fiber should be soluble. And the recommendation is for about 25 to 30 grams of dietary fiber per day. 
So that would mean that about six to eight grams a day is coming from your soluble fiber. And some nutrition so, labels do split this. Some do. I think it is more common that they don't, but just kind of looking at the ingredients and, you know, just balancing it out. It's a, it can be overwhelming when we break it all down and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to look at this and I have to look at this and I have to look at this. But if we go back to the other sheet here, I mean, there are, if you're going to start with a couple of things, then I would really start with looking at the serving size, looking at the calories and looking at the carbohydrates. And the other thing about fiber is we want to fuel our body in the, in the best way possible. So, and I know I've talked to a lot of clients, a lot of mamas about the five to one rule. Connie, have you heard of the five to one rule? I have, yeah. Okay. But I mean, this is my industry. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, when we look at our carbohydrates, we want to compare the number of carbohydrates to the grams of fiber. So I think this is a 37. My circle is, is uh, uh, overlapping here, but I also have it detailed at the bottom here. And I use an example of whole wheat wonder bread. And so if we look at the package of whole wheat wonder bread, we're seeing that there are 30 grams of carbohydrates and three grams of fiber. So what we wanna do is we wanna divide the carbohydrates by the fiber. So 30 divided by three, and that's giving us 10. Now, ideally, we want to aim for foods that are giving us five or less, because that means that we are getting a good ratio of fiber for that number of carbohydrates. So this whole wheat wonder bread is not the ideal bread. And, you know, this is something that I look at, well, not every week when I go to the store, but if I don't get my kind of usual bread, if I'm at a different store or they're out of it or whatever, I'm the crazy person, well, not crazy person. I'm the person <laughs> in the bread aisle with my calculator because I can't do math in my head. I'm there kind of plugging in my numbers and being like, oh, nope, not you. Let me try this one. <laughs> and I think the bread aisle is like the most misleading food because you have all of these breads that are labeled as, you know, whole wheat, seed bread, you know, your fat is going to be higher because it feeds in healthy fats, which is not a bad thing, but that typically affects the carb, carb to fiber ratio as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a great thing. The five to one rule is great to look at for breads, for pastas, for rices or other types of grains. And, you know, it just helps you to choose a better option. If you're, if the rice in your pantry is giving you, or let's say pasta, if the pasta in your pantry is giving you, you know, a 15 when you divide, then maybe next time you go to buy pasta, you choose a pasta that's maybe seven. I mean, it doesn't have to be below five, but the closer we get to five or below that, it's your body is getting different nutrition from that ingredient. And it's just fueling your body in a much better way. You're giving your body so many more nutrients. And a lot of people, when they make those changes, they, they feel it in their body. So try yeah. it out. I think that's an easy, an easy thing to try. And looking at it in the bigger picture, why do, why do we always want to cut out carbs? Because we tend to overeat them because we have the super processed semolina flour uh, pasta or the white bread or whole wheat bread, which doesn't really mean anything. It's just darker. And whenever we start integrating these healthier portions, as long as you pay attention to, sorry, these healthier ingredients and higher fiber content, um, once you, as long as you pay attention to the portions, you will eat less and still feel that same amount of full, but it's uh, it's a mental thing too because you're you grew up knowing how much pasta you believe to be enough. But once you start making these swaps, you got to be conscious and aware of like how your body is responding to it and just being open to exploring different ways for like pasta and breads to taste. Yeah, so exactly. We, we believe in uh, carbs, we believe in pizza, we believe in like making room for everything delicious uh, that we wanna have, but knowing that in order to uh, live healthy and to maybe work towards weight loss or strength gain or whatever it is, um, 
we have to be more conscious of the foods that we're choosing and the portions of them that we're eating. Exactly. Absolutely. And I think when we realize, like I said before, what that portion size actually is on that nutrition label, it's like, oh, I've been eating four times that, especially when it comes to the grains, the rice, the pasta, things like that. And, you know, the fiber really helps to keep us fuller for longer. So looking at the, the fiber ratio, choosing more fruits and vegetables that are going to bulk up our stomach more, eating those things first, because if we're eating our fruits and veggies, well, let's maybe just talk about veggies for a second. If we're eating our salad first at dinner, and then we're eating our half of our plate of vegetables, and then we're eating our protein. By the time we get to that starchy or carbohydrate, we're going to be eating less of that because our, our body has, our, our stomach is getting fuller, it's stretching, it's signaling our brain that it's getting full, and we're not going to eat as much. So if you're not eating your veggies first, especially at dinner, start with that modification. I love it. And I know that we could talk forever and ever about all these things. So um, if anyone who's watching has questions about this, Erica is in the group. She's our coach for Strong as a Mother. Put them in the comments and she will get to them. Also, if you want a copy of that nutrition label cheat sheet, just comment yes, please, or nutrition cheat sheet. Just let us know that you'd like a copy and we'll send it over to you because we are all about sharing and empowering you guys with the knowledge to make these healthy choices for yourselves. So thank you so much, Erica. It's always a delight. I'm I'm shocked as, at how, many, how much time I have spent with you virtually versus in person, uh, but that's COVID life, I guess, isn't it? I know. So but it still, it still works. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, anyone who's watching, mamas, let's keep the conversation going in the comments. I'd love to hear your takeaways and answer any of those questions that you might have. Uh, if you want to connect with Erica, like I said, she's in the group, so you can tag her or send her a message. And please be sure to invite other mamas into this group. It takes a village to live a happy and healthy life on the journey through motherhood and all moms are welcome in this one. So until next week, stay strong, stay caffeinated and hydrated. Cheers. Cheers. And I will see you in the group. Thanks so much. Bye.